Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Dirks, and on behalf of ACRL and Choice, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Transform Your Discovery Approach, A New Vision, which is sponsored by Ex Libris, a ProQuest company. Today's discussion is one in a series of sponsored webinars from ACRL and Choice that addresses new ideas, developments, and products of interest to the academic library community. Free to users, these structured 60-minute live presentations provide the opportunity for interactive discussions of important new issues in academic librarianship by librarians, vendors, authors, and other interested stakeholders. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features of the webinar software. In the main area of the screen, you should be able to follow along with the presentation materials. Along the right-hand side, you should see a Q&A panel and a chat panel. If you don't, uh, there's a little dialog cloud button sort of in the middle of the bottom of your screen. Uh, that will open up the chat panel and the Q&A you can find probably in the uh, little three dots button next to that dialog cloud. Um, please use the Q&A panel to submit questions to our speakers. We'll hold all of those for the end when we'll have a dedicated question and answer time. So please feel free to send them in throughout the presentation and we will get to as many as we have time for. Um, if you have any technical issues, you can use the chat panel to let me know about that and I will uh, troubleshoot the issue with you privately there. Today, we are using um, the hashtag ACRLChoiceWebinars, so please feel free to shout out to us. We're at choice underscore reviews on Twitter. Also note that we are recording today's program. Um, so uh, everyone who registered should receive a link to that recording within about 24 hours of the event. Um, all right, so our speakers today are Christine Stone, Director of Product Management at Ex Libris, and Ellen Jones, who is the Director, Digital Library and Technical Services at the New School Libraries and Archives. So with that, we are ready to get started. So I'll pass the uh, ball over to you, Christine. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so hello everyone, and in my presentation today, I want to talk about how discovery is changing and especially how we can use data intelligence to create a better and more advanced discovery. Um, I'm starting with a couple of slides um, about discovery in general to give some more background before diving into the more specific topic, and I also want to make two specific points which I think are important here. Um, originally, when discovery systems started to emerge in the library environment, it was a measure to move with the library catalogs to a more modern user experience um, and also to give access to the vast increasing amount of electronic material. Um, that is still true today, but library discovery has become far more than just a search system. Um, library discovery systems can open doors, and that is my first main point here. I find this very important. Um, of course, the single search box experience and access to the library collection is important. Um, today, we have a mass of material. We have published and aggregator content, digital repositories, research outputs, such as research data. Um, of course, a lot of open access content, uh, material from the library collections, including, of course, the, the print material, audiovisual material, and so on. So there's a lot of data that we index. Um, in addition, we pull in information from external uh, services that is used to enrich the index data. Um, that could be old metrics, for example, or synthetics unbound. And I come back to this later on in this presentation because, again, I think this is a very important point. But because of the size of the indexes and the often very special nature um, of the collections, uh, we need to think beyond the one search box approach. So add-on functions, for example, like uh, more like this, uh, are very useful to find the right material. So library discovery provides information, but it also is a gateway to information. And that is how we design our systems. So for example, apart from the one search box, we are also providing options to recommend further resources. So this is also a gateway for those resources. So again, library discover is a lot about opening different doors for the users. The second more general point I would like to make is that as much as discovery systems open doors, um, there are also many doors to discovery. Discovery needs to be where the user is, not necessarily expect the user to come to the system or the library. And the value it brings needs to be self-evident. Um, we're looking at uh, simple ways to integrate the search box into other systems that are, that are important for the user's daily workflows. That means, for example, that we provide direct access from uh, learning and research services. Uh, we do this certainly for our own systems, like the Leganto Reading List or Explorer as a research platform, um, but that certainly also applies to other systems. 
Um, there are options to highlight specific collections, for example, with the collection discovery tool in Primo and to integrate this with places where users work. Um, and linked data, of course, is a very important aspect. It allows you um, to publish your data to search engines like Google, where your users might be, but maybe also to offer library service in other platforms like social media. Um, and the integration with open source discovery layers of third party systems is also, of course, um, important for many of our customers. So our approach to discovery is to bring all this together. And again, the two points I wanted to make in this, um, this introduction are about opening doors and about having a lot of doors that go to discovery. And I come back to this later on in this presentation. So um, after the, the general points, um, let's look at the changes that are happening in our environment. It's really rapidly changing and evolving. We see a substantial rise in the amount of material, but also in the material types actually that we index. Our index contains more than 3 billion records and that's increasing really, really fast. At the same time, we have new technologies that are delivering uh, more processing power for big data. That means that we have now actually capabilities to process vast amount of data much faster than ever before. And also very important not to forget, users are increasingly influenced by social media and consumer platforms and what they see there. They're used to recommendations, to push services, to personalization, for example. And that also influences how they view and what they expect from our systems, what they, for example, view as intuitive and what they also see as hurdles. Um, perception is, is changing with the environment users grow up with. Um, so the challenge is that we have an increasing amount of data and we need to make sure of the, the make, make sure that we can use new technologies to tailor discovery to, to user needs that is also changing. Um, and for that, we need to get more creative and also to rethink and to transform discovery and maybe also to change our view of what the discovery is. Um, so for meeting the challenge, first of all, we are looking more and more at the use of intelligence um, that is gained from, from data processing and essentially data science to create services. Um, we have these big data repositories with our discovery index, but also with usage data, for example, click streams and the likes. That can help us to create contextual services to help users to sift through material. Um, from user studies, we know that users quite often are not sure about the topic they need, um, they need material for. Um, we even found this with graduates and researchers, although they seem confident, first of all, in their topic area. Um, but on, second, uh, on, on a second look, there are actually lots of unknowns and they need to branch out and find the right keywords that help um, to, to do their searches. So we need to create entry points for them that goes beyond the one search result list. Um, apart from creating those services, we also need to create a repository that allows us to make better use of the data that we have, um, in, especially in future uh, or for future, uh, for future services. Basically consolidate the different indexes and create one big repository that services as the central um, discovery index. I hope I'm not going too fast, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there are lots, lots of different things here to cover. So um, those of you who use our systems probably already saw the announcement that we are creating a new um, advanced discovery index, which is simply called CDI Central Discovery Index. CDI will replace the current Summon and Primo Central Indexes, and it will also serve as one central index for both um, Primo Primo and Summon. Um, I should emphasize that we maintain our two flagship discovery systems, Primo and Summon, and that does not change. We just change the central index. Um, that has a lot of advantages. First of all, it will enable us to ingest data faster, to update data faster, of course, and also to achieve better quality data. It will also, and that is coming back to the data intelligence topic, enable us to focus better on creating smart services as part of our discovery workflows. Basically, it is about being ready for the future. Um, where we are moving to is to have data intelligence at the core of our systems. Um, we are, for example, focusing on data relations and relationship graphs. And I'll show you briefly what this looks like in the flow. Um, we have Primo and Summon. Um, both access the central discovery index um, for search in the Ex Libris provided data pools. And in addition, we are in the process of building a graph database that holds relationships between the indexed items. 
Um, and we also have, of course, the locally indexed data. In the case of Summon, this data is actually stored in the central index as well. In the case of Primo, we have separate indexes. And in both cases, this stays the same with CDI. We're not going to change that. But the point here is um, that we will create relations across the indexes. For example, if we create a relationship between a book and a book review, the book might be in the local index and the book review, of course, in the central index because it's coming from electronic material and, and so on. Um, of course, this is not something that is happening overnight. Um, these parts are parts of a project that is running throughout 2019. And in the case of CDI, the majority of our customers will actually move in 2020. So we'll have a, a project that goes over two years. Um, and the move will be seamless for our customers. So you will just switch to the, um, to, to the new index if you use uh, Primo or Summon. Let's have a look at the um, relationship graphs. Um, I show you some examples. Um, some relations are, of course, more straightforward than others. Uh, you have relations between works and their references, um, other works that are citing them. Articles might have a close relation because they're published in a specific special topic issue of a journal. Uh, the author is, of course, a connection. Articles and research data they're using. We index increasingly institutional repositories and databases or data sources like DataCite. Um, the awareness of the need to create machine readable connection or readable connecting identifiers in this area is increasing. Um, and therefore, we also see an increasing ability to create such connections. Of course, the identifiers are very important to um, identify those connections. Um, we have usage based connections. You might have heard about the VX recommender that creates connections based on what users use together, basically, their click streams, similar to services you find on Amazon or, or other more consumer based um, website, websites. Um, and then there are, of course, topic connections. Different articles can share a combination of different topics, and I will talk about this a bit more in a moment. All of these are direct connections to my article in the middle, but they're also in a transitive way related to each other. So I can create strong direct connections, but also connections that are across different groups, um, and that can also offer interesting insights or create the basis for um, a new service. Um, this is all probably a bit abstract, um, but it is the basis here for, for creating smart services, smart discovery service, and it gives users more context and also provides a, a sort of serendipitous discovery experience. And I illustrate this more with, with some examples. So first of all, um, this is kind of an overview of what we have today and, and what we are actually working on. Not all of this is, is released as a service yet. Um, those of you using our systems probably already know about BX and probably also about the citation trail. Both are services that have been around for a while, actually. The citation trail has been in Primo for a couple of years, and it's now also um, available in Summon. BX creates recommendations based on usage. It captures usage from the link resolvers. It creates a network of usage-based uh, connections. And it evaluates articles to suggest to a user um, based on an article the user is looking at. So the, the, the article is the starting point, and then it looks up all the connections and um, suggests other articles that might be relevant here. Um, the citation tool is using connections from items that cite, um, cite each other. Um, we designed it in a way that it provides a discovery trail, and I'll I show you this in, in a minute. We are also working on other services. One is about formal relationships. Um, that's what I already mentioned, books to book reviews, um, but also book chapters to other chapters of the same book, articles to research data, and so on. Um, and the last one is to enhance uh, topic exploration. I start with the BX Recommender. I searched for health and chocolate here, and I find an article. The Recommender finds other articles that are, are about the same or, or similar topics. And you can see here on the right-hand side the list that's a screenshot from Summon. Um, not all have the same keywords. For example, the second one, it offers different aspects that uh, might be of interest and also provide uh, the user with more subtopics to look for. And of course, it provides um, also more material based on the first, uh, the first entry point, the first article I looked at. Um, so that's also an advantage that I find very quickly additional material without having to start a new search. Um, the citation trail, 
um, also uses an article as the entry point. It allows the users to browse through lists of citing and cited articles and therefore look at other items that are related to the first one. The citation trail goes beyond suggesting a list of related items. It allows the user to go from one list to the next list and the next list. So for example, here I have my first article. This is my entry point here. And then I can go um, forward and um, click on the, um, the little icon that is deciding and cited by. Um, I get my first list of um, sources that are cited in my first article. And then I can click just um, at the next one and I get the next list and the next list. Um, and on top I have my trail or my path and I can um, at every time, at, at, at every point I see where I am um, and I can go back and I can go forward. So this is a real trail. It actually kind of replicates a very common way that uh, journal article readers use for find additional content. They do exactly the same. They look at the reference list, they find more interesting material, they go to the next reference list and so on. So this is basically a new way to present an existing information seeking behavior that many users are already familiar with. Um, the, the two previous services, um, that is the BX recommend and citation trail already exist. We are now working on additional services to complement them. I showed earlier that we created a graph database of relations. We plan to add to this database different types of relations. We start with something simpler. Um, for example, here with connecting book chapters with chapters of the same book, and then we move on to some more difficult ones like connecting books and book reviews where you don't always have a direct relationship and it's sometimes a little bit difficult um, to use identifiers or use the metadata to connect them. What you see here is a very initial design. Um, it will probably not look exactly like this when we release it, but this should just give you a good idea how this could look like for the user. So we have a book chapter as the entry point, and I show um, a link in the detailed view. You see this link on top here, and if I click on it, I get um, the other chapters of the same book um, listed in, in this list here. Another example, um, I have a connection between book and book reviews. That's what I also mentioned already. Uh, we have a book in the result list. I can open the detailed view. Um, I see that there are book uh, reviews available. It's maybe a little bit difficult to see here, but you see this uh, as a link on top. And then I can go into the list. Again, I get on top the book where I'm coming from, and then I get the list um, as of, of the book reviews here. We will build those relations up slowly. For example, the book to book review match is not always a simple one. I already mentioned that. We will certainly not capture everything immediately. This will grow over time. Um, generally, this applies to all connections between material. They all grow over time. Um, these services use formal relationship and, and they really create context and provide the user with more material and essentially also provide a learning experience. Um, another example of using connections, um, this time informal connections, is topic exploration. We have the topic explorer function on summon. This is something that already exists for a while. Um, this shows an overview, but also generates suggestions for more related topics to search. Um, again, this function has existed for a while, but now, and that is kind of a, a peek under the hood of our data lab, um, we are experimenting with some ideas to extend the service. And I would like to show you briefly how this could look like in, in future. Um, just to emphasize, um, this is, uh, it is a research project from our data lab. This is not something that we are going to release tomorrow. Um, so in this example, I have an indication in the result list that there are topic connections available. You see this on the right hand side um, in my brief result list and I can just click on it. Um, and I get a page that shows, uh, first of all, on top the topics for the article I'm coming from that have the most weight, or, or in other words, the strongest connection with the article. The new result list shows other articles that have the same or similar topic connections. I can choose one or more topics from the topic pane and get yet another result list with items that are connected to those topics. So I can basically go from one to the next one to the next one, explore the topic, see what other topics are connected to them, and also see material that is connected to those, those topics. Um, 
So this is how a topic trail really could look like. Um, as I said, it is in an experimenting stage. We might come out with a small proof of concept feature later this year to be able to try this out from the user perspective, really. Um, it depends on, on how the work is, is progressing. So this is just to give you an idea what might be possible in future and what services we could offer users um, to, to learn more and also to find more material. I said earlier that um, that nobody um, is going to do everything really. There are many new services and, and projects out there that can offer substantial value to, to users when integrated into discovery. Um, services that extend the discovery experience, but also new delivery methods, for example. So there are Browsine, Unpaywall, Altmetrics, um, just to name a few of them. Some of them are subscription services and some of them might be free. So I would like to show you how this could look like with Syntax Unbound, which is also an external services of our service, obviously. So with Syntax, you can pull in exploration services and more information for books. In this example, I have the Oxford Companion of British History, and you can see on the right-hand side recommendations for other books pulled in from Syntax um, Unbound. But it also offers other services. So um, here you can see that we have a look inside feature, for example, um, or you can check out reader reviews if, if there are any, of course. And the user can look up also um, professional reviews and also see other versions of the same book. Our goal as a discovery provider here is to offer tools to integrate services that libraries choose for their users. I would like to point out, for example, Primo Studio here, which allows the community to provide add-ons and publish them for everyone to use. It's not just about one provider to provide everything, but also to to work, um, to work with the community and to enable the community to contribute. And that really adds significant value to, to discovery. Um, the benefit for the user, um, the goal here is to help the user to find what they need and also have a learning experience. There are very distinct benefits with such services. So users can find easily and fast material with only one search, of course. Um, the user finds an entry point. The system provides contextual services and discovery path from that entry point. The features provide a serendipitous discovery experience. They are also intuitive because today's users are coming from environments where they are used to such services and they have a certain expectation to see the same on discovery. They can learn more about the topic by finding keywords they did not previously think about, maybe. And we are creating context around material as well. With the mass of material available, this is becoming increasingly important, I think. This is a slide that I already showed at the beginning. And now at the end of my presentation, I would like to come back to this because I find it important. Um, Library Discover can open doors to many things. There is, of course, the one search experience. And we will always have users who come to the system, search for a specific book or article. And all they want is to find it and to get it. Um, but even for them, add-on services can be very relevant and also very welcome. It can save users time and provide a more efficient way to learn about a topic as well as, as gathering material. Discovery should never be a dead end. Um, it should be a gateway to other services and other information as needed by the user. Um, and I think also context is an important concept for discovery today. And we are looking at users who come with different expectations and perceptions than uh, that we had um, 10 years ago. Um, so again, it's really about opening doors um, and about treating the discovery system, not just as, as a search system, but also as something that um, can, can lead to other things. So coming to my summary, um, big data is transforming our world. And that brings a lot of challenges, but it's also quite exciting because it's also bringing us opportunities. Um, we're looking increasingly beyond in indexing or beyond just indexing the data. Uh, data intelligence becomes a core part of our discovery systems. I think the future is very much about transforming of discovery to move from simple search systems um, that we originally had to a really intelligent and contextual discovery experience. Um, and lastly, library discovery can and should open doors. Um, and there are also and can and should be many doors to library discovery. Discovery needs to move into places where users already are. Um, that is specifically their academic ecosystem, reading lists, virtual learning environments, or research environments, and so on. But also Google and other services they may use. Library services are essential to their success. Um, that's at least my opinion. But it needs to be part of the processes and not really stand isolated. And with that, I'm going to pass this on to Ellen. Can everyone hear me? I can hear okay. you, so I think, yes, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, um, excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take this, uh, uh, say many of the same things that Christine said. So, uh, um, although I'm going to take this a little bit from a different perspective in terms of different types of uh, services that this may or may not um, uh, inform. Um, I have, uh, the, I'd like to start out uh, uh, thanking people, um, uh, most importantly, uh, my university librarian who actually gives me time to play with this kind of stuff. Um, the folks at NYU Libraries who are actually providing some of the context for us to actually do some of this playing. Um, the user communities of Iluna and Igloo, uh, the Ex Libris User Group of North America, and the uh, International Group of Ex Libris uh, Users. Um, the, the product working community uh, for Primo is, is very live, is very active, and uh, very vocal. Um, and so uh, it's, it's been a pleasure actually chairing the, uh, the working group and, and hearing feedback and also um, hearing ideas about how things uh, can actually move forward. Um, finally, uh, um, we're part of another consortium, which is the Pennsylvania Academic Library Consortium. Um, and uh, some folks over at uh, Project ReShare, which is an open source uh, resource sharing project that um, PALSI has initiated. Many of the issues that we've had in terms of the limits of what it is that discovery is, uh, that project is actually in response to. And I find both the conversations as well as the, the thinking around it uh, um, cutting if not bleeding edge at times. And so uh, it's it's interesting to think of big data both in the context of Ex Libris and also outside of Ex Libris and how some of that information is actually going to get into some of these vended systems and to think about how open source and vendor actually can work together as opposed to being in competition with one another. Um, and of course, I want to thank some of the folks uh, at Ex Libris. Uh, um, they, know me, I think, uh, uh, in some ways as much as, as I know them, and is, the conversations have been um, very useful in thinking about uh, Primo, uh, um, thinking about Alma, thinking about Summon as these discovery products, and thinking about kind of what the next generation of these are, um, thinking about uh, working with Primo VE, as well as uh, um, other feature sets of the current Primo uh, software has really, uh, really been fascinating. Um, I'm going to actually focus on five different areas. Uh, one is to talk about some of the expectations that searchers actually bring to the Primo or the Summon or Discovery application. Actually talk about the, the slippery slope of what is actually being searched when we talk about collections. Um, Christine talked a little bit about the index. I'm going to refer back to it for a minute, so uh, a slight reprise or return. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about search intelligence and microservice, um, because I think that they're important to talk about as way, ways of perspectives of thinking about uh, um, how we actually going to use this big data. Um, so. First, I want to talk a little bit about what are what are the models that people are actually bringing to search. Um, uh, not embarrassingly, so here's my Netflix uh, 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 my Netflix screen, um, my Amazon screen, um, my YouTube screen, my uh, uh, Google screen. When I search nature, obviously, um, not only is it a promoted link, but it's also a link that um, has uh, multiple different meanings somehow uh, the preference of a journal title uh, um, Google already knows. And I think that this is important when thinking about intelligence, not just from the perspective of retrieval, but also in thinking about different types of contexts that may already be going into the calculation of these results um, that we may not necessarily be aware of. Um, and finally, uh, the, uh, the mother of all search, uh, um, Google, in terms of what actually comes up when we're searching. These types of applications are the applications that our users are actually bringing when they come to the library discovery layer. Um, just taking a look here at the uh, applications that patrons are using, 
Um, obviously, Google with some of the highest level of engagement. Um, and you can see on down, um, Wikipedia is as well. Um, not only interesting is it, not only is it interesting to think about uh, the destination, the, certainly the low percentage of uh, traffic coming from search uh, for Google, but also the amount of search that's actually coming from Wikipedia, I think is uh, equally telling in what it is that Christine was talking about in terms of getting people to the discovery layer as well as um, bringing them from, from the discovery layer to their content. So if patrons are using search in other areas of their life, how might the library might be able to uh, leverage this experience instead of, as I said, building a competitor to it? Um, the, Jacob Nielsen is a very uh, well-known um, writer within the usability community, and his first law, I think, makes a lot of sense as we think about search, um, which is users spend most of their time on other sites, and they apply those mental models of scanning search results, requesting material, finding recommendations or related materials, viewing media, browsing images, and getting inspired in some ways. Um, all of these are functions that the, uh, um, that the discovery layer is actually bringing up, but they're already, uh, um, they're already applications that are doing this in, um, in other areas of people's lives. Those mental models that they're actually bringing from those sites are now being applied to our library specific search experience. And it's important that these applications actually inform the, the applications that we're actually building. So one of the things that I think is important, an important existential question to ask is, is the goal to create a destination for search or is it to publish uh, results to other search engines for indexing and discovery? In other words, does Google just do search so well that we should just completely forget about the discovery layer? Well, in my mind, the answer is both. Um, we should be looking for ways to publish our sitemaps, um, and then we should also be looking for ways to, uh, and so, that, so that items are searchable in Google, but then we should also be providing an immersive um, best practice or uh, best case uh, uh, discovery experience um, using some of the data that, uh, that Christine was talking about. As I pointed out before, um, Ironically enough, the amount of time that people actually spend on Google is the highest amount of site, uh, highest amount of any of the search sites that are that are out there. Um, the fact that people are spending eight minutes looking at ten pages, um, looking at the number of sites that they're actually indexing, that's not the number of pages, that's the number of domains. So I want to be clear there, um, is absolutely staggering. Um, and again, I want to point back to the fact that even though something like Amazon uh, has almost a quarter of its traffic actually generated um, from a search engine, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're giving up the search experience completely. I would say that this is a lesson that we can certainly learn within, within libraries. So <clears throat> a way to potentially think about this um, would be, um, as I said, Building a search tool for patrons that's both immersive, that's thinking about things like rich media, that's thinking about things like related items and building relationships between results, but also publishing site, sitemaps to Google and other search services. So one particular way of maybe thinking about this would be that if we are searching uh, um, or publishing our sitemaps and having them indexed into Google, maybe we don't necessarily have to have these uh, search results um, boosted for everyone, maybe if we're using Google EDU services, we can actually look at the domain names and actually boost those records that actually have the domain name of the library. These are the types of things that we can and should be thinking about when, um, when, uh, when we're thinking about the Google, Google experience, not necessarily just preferencing and pushing up results for everyone, but maybe specific sectors of populations that have uh, specific types of criteria, maybe things like physical location, 
um, go to Google and type in the word auto repair. And depending on where you are, it'll tell you different types of localized uh, um, material. Now, you're not necessarily putting your zip code into that search, but Google is actually taking some of those contextual, uh, um, the contextual information and actually applying it Search, uh, applying it to your search, and then set, and and setting certain parameters and boosting, um, boosting certain results that match criteria that aren't necessarily submitted, but are part of the state of your actual search. I think that there are really important lessons that can be learned from this, particularly for those institutions that are using Google EDU services or Google Authentication services, where domain mapping can actually um, help in some of this boosting in ways that uh, are not necessarily uh, applied to everyone equally. Because if all of the libraries are actually trying to boost all of their results at once, does that really make sense? Because we're all in competition with one another. Um, so this is one potential proposal that we're actually looking at um, for sitemap in terms of boosting. And I think it's something that we should be paying attention to. In essence, learning some of the lessons from contextualized, personalized search from Google and seeing if we can actually apply it to the discovery service. The second thing that I think uh, we, can, uh, we can all agree on is that the discovery, uh, the, the, the concept of the collection has actually changed. Um, when actually looking at some features that users wanted, um, one of the things that I was uh, a little astonished by was how time is becoming an increasingly important facet for patrons to use um, when they're thinking about how to retrieve things. So for example, they wanna know how long they can have the item. They wanna know if they can get it right now. They wanna know if they can't get it now, how long is it gonna to take to get? Um, and something that being in New York, I, I guess I've always thought everything needs to be delivered. Um, but one of the things that we've also learned in having conversations with colleagues within ReShare is that many times people want to know where the item is so that they can actually drive over there to get it. So they're as much interested in getting directions, car directions to that book as much as they are in getting the book delivered to them. And so these types of uh, um, services are services that aren't necessarily baked within the metadata of the actual item, but they're related services and calculations that are increasingly, that users increasingly want in order to shape their discovery experience. So a traditional OPAC um, basically had the locally held collection. Um, it had maybe your institutional repository and we, uh, we, Basically, with the addition of something like Primo Central or Summon, it also included our licensed content. Well, yeah, that was very kind of four or five years ago, but now we've increasingly included DDA, open access or open education content, as well as consortial holdings. And all of this um, needs to be in a discovery, uh, a single discovery experience instead of sending people elsewhere to other places. Um, they're expecting the limits of the uh, discovery service in some ways to push the boundary of what's searched and what isn't. And it's these types of, uh, um, it's these types of uh, boundaries that are really beginning to push big data. So the, 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 the catalog then becomes about what you can get and not necessarily about what it is that you own. So, I think that's a really important transition that we have to begin thinking about. ReShare, for example, is thinking specifically about this. Um, certainly, uh, graph databases and other types of relational databases are also thinking about this. People who got this also wanted these other things. Uh, these other things happen to be physically close to you. These other things are not. Um, all of these kind of contextual um, pieces of information, as well as um, information that, that's in traditional descriptive metadata needs to be taken into account for the tradition for the, uh, the, the the next generation discovery experience. So, as I said, um, results need to include context as well as content. Um, they'll need to be smarter. They'll need to be contextual. They'll need to be personalized. Um, 
the user profile, the geographic location, even the query itself will help shape results. And what I mean by this is that natural language processing um, can provide a lot of clues to, uh, what, to what used to be pre-filters. So for example, if you remember in the old Primo, uh, the classic Primo interface, there was a drop-down menu that asked the question, do you want uh, images? Do you only want to see audio? Do you only want to see video? Do you want to see books, uh, et cetera? Now we're looking at things where the actual question guides the type of resource types that are actually delivered within the result set. So for example, where is returns maps? Who is returns biographies? When is returns dates and calendars? How do I returns FAQs or articles? What is dictionary entries? Show me images, videos, etc. Even the length of the query is actually important here. For example, in that nature uh, um, example that I showed before, um, the fact that something was a journal title match should prioritize um, that, particularly in an academic context, um, that that's, that's what nature means to me. Um, oh, anyway. Um, However, it might also be an author name. It may also be a, a, a title of an article or a title of a, um, a, title of a book. Um, longer queries tend to be known item searches. Shorter queries tend to be more either browse or uh, topical types of searches. And with those types, with that type of knowledge, um, we can create a, a, a context for a much more immersive search experience. So just a shameless plug, along some of these lines, there's a, uh, the Ex Libris user group actually has uh, conferences. Greg Davis is actually going to be talking about connecting Primo to Alexa um, to not only think about this in terms of a visual interface that actually needs to be uh, connected to Primo, but also um, voice-enabled uh, uh, interfaces. Um, there was a presentation that was done in St. Petersburg a couple of years ago on chatty discovery that was actually looking at connecting Slack um, to a chat bot that was then connected to Primo as well. And it was returning articles and books um, and actually renewing books online. The demo uh, is in my list of slides here. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, so we're, we're again focusing much more on a search experience instead of a search result. Um, the two people who were really important in teaching me this, uh, uh, John Rockin from Johns Hopkins and Scott Dalton from NYU Libraries, um, worked on an application called Umlaut, which was another, which was a presentation layer for SFX. And one of the things that Scott introduced me to was this concept of microservices or a software approach that basically de-emphasizes this big monolithic piece of software that does everything and really begins looking at the presentation layer as a bunch of different applications that's going out and retrieving data from different data sources. So let's, let's take something that we know is a pain, painful experience in our library loan, for example. Somebody goes through the discovery service or they go through a database, they get to the place and they're basically in a frustrated uh, search. Um, they go to a link that opens up another window um, that window has a form. That form, uh, they have to add a note and then they click submit. I'm going to share my desktop here for a second. Um, okay. And maybe think a little bit differently about what the interlibrary loan experience should actually be. So I find this particular uh, item. I see that it's not available at Bobst, and I've got to do something. Well, in the old in the old situ in the old uh, uh, old model, I would have to click on a link. That link would open up another application. I would go to Iliad. I would fill out my web pages, and I would hit send request. Taking the user out of the user experience or out of the discovery experience to another application, and maybe they remembered to go back. Maybe they didn't. In this particular case, all I'm doing is hitting send request. Now that's taken all of the bibliographic information, all of the login information. It sends that to a database table, which then runs an API call against our EasyBorrow um, service. 
And if it's not available in Easy Borrow, then it actually sends the item over to Iliad. So all of this automation is happening behind the scenes, but the user is never actually taken to those applications. It's submitted directly to those services on their behalf. Uh, Jeff Peterson's uh, um, Hadi Trust, um, BX Recommender, um, as well as some things from Notre Dame. And you can see here that these microservices actually take the metadata from the session that's within Primo, sends the service to a server, and then basically gives the user an interaction to say that that thing has actually succeeded. Now, Putting this kind of model on steroids, you have somebody like the National Museum of Art actually delivering rich media experiences where the uh, material can actually be zoomed in, it can be annotated, it can be shared, um, all within the discovery layer. Um, never taking them to another system or another digital asset management system, but staying within the context of the discovery experience. And really, that's the goal is to keep people within, uh, within the discovery service and actually engaged and looking at related media um, and getting them the material that they need, whether it's a video, whether it's an ebook, um, that should be the gold standard. Um, so again, the interface isn't static, but it's a production of media or microservices running within all levels of the application. Um, some components of the page finish at runtime, but others are actually waiting for the user to actually interact with it. And then as the user is interacting with it, the interface changes them, giving them feedback that something has happened. And it's actually an engagement experience rather than an information delivery experience. So I just want to say a few conclusions. Um, the goal then is to get the users to, uh, to discovery and delivery and to, uh, and, and to access the content, not necessarily just get them to the content. Um, we can do that a whole bunch of different ways using familiar models of things that have happened within the commercial sector. Um, and we can, encourage, we can encourage engagement and, and uh, interaction through these types of fulfillment services, rich media, related materials. It's all coming together into uh, an experience that hopefully um, doesn't look like Times Square, but is actually a much more guided, um, uh, sensible user experience. Um, we know that uh, as, as patrons are actually enjoying working with the service, um, they're much more likely to reuse it. So incorporating these services into the discovery layer um, basically means that we're keeping them longer and delivering better service. So with that, I'd like to end and turn it over to Scott. Okay, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, this one uh, is directed at Christine. Christine, uh, you mentioned that you have 3 billion records in uh, your record. Uh, Scott, I can actually not hear you. Yep, Scott, you're yeah, kind of breaking up too. there. Okay. You mentioned that you have 3 billion records uh, in your index. Uh, who's the we? Oh, who's the we in the 3 billion records? Is it ProCloud? Oh, is it okay. Favorite? Who's the we? Okay, sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. Um, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned that uh, that earlier. This is about Ex Libris. It's about Ex Libris Discovery Index. It's, uh, indexes. It's, it's, it's not related to the ProQuest indexes. Okay, Alan, this uh, question is directed at you. Uh, where is the data from the table that you displayed from? Uh, that is actually from uh, Alexa, uh, the top 500 websites. Okay, uh, another question that's come in is uh, directed at Christine. Could you elaborate a bit more on how you will be exposing CDI content to Google or Google Scholar? What might the end user see? 
Oh, okay. Um, we are actually not exposing CDI data to, to Google. Maybe that was a little bit, um, uh, it, it was kind of a not, not quite clear. So, so what we are exposing is, or what we are enabling actually the library to expose is, is their index data. Um, it's not, um, it's not really us, us publishing anything. Um, now I'm not a linked data expert. Luckily enough, I have colleagues who are, who are experts in that. So I'm a little bit, uh, you know, on thin ice here with what I'm saying, but we are implementing things like schema.org to just enable people to publish their content um, out of our indexes to Google. Um, We're not doing this without, you know, anyone um, knowing about it or it, it's really the library's decision what they're going to do there. We are the enabler here in, in, in this context. Okay, uh, the next question is for Alan. Uh, what version of Primo are you using? Are you using Primo Classic or Primo VE? Um, using Primo with back office, not VE. But it, again, I, I want to be clear about something. The Primo customization framework uh, um, would allow uh, the Iliad demonstration that I just did to, it, it could happen there as well. It, it's the, the idea behind the customization framework is that regardless of what version of Primo you're in, um, those types of uh, um, microservices could actually be injected in either interface. The, the customization framework is basically the same. Okay, uh, this one's for Christine. Uh, regarding Topic Explorer, how are these related topics generated? Does it rely on controlled vocabulary such as subject headings or something else? Um, we haven't decided yet. Um, this is an initial project. So in, in this initial project, we are just using um, just uh, just a list of topics. Um, we haven't decided yet if we are really going to use um, controlled vocabulary or if we are moving to um, other mechanisms. There are mechanisms actually to extract concepts and topics um, by um, by algorithms rather than using controlled vocabulary. Um, so, so there are different ways to achieve the same thing. We haven't really decided that, and, and I should emphasize we are really experimenting at this point. Okay, uh, another question that's come in is, uh, is Exlibris working with Google EDU for library holdings to be weighted at the top of the results? Uh, I'm going to answer that. This was a harebrained idea that I had, but I was basically using uh, Google EDU. Uh, I, I don't know if they are or not. Um, I, I was actually the person who was making the suggestion that since Google actually knew um, domain names and they also knew um, login credentials and, and login uh, basically exposing the entire uh, uh, EDU person schema when they log in, um, that could potentially be a variable that they could use to uh, for localized boosting. I, Christine, you can talk about whether you guys are working with Google or not. Um, not that I'm aware of. But we, we are, you know, we are doing things with Google, but not not, um, not that specific project. I, I'm, I'm not aware of it, at least. Okay, uh, this question is directed at Christine. Um, are Primo and Summon going to be completely replaced by CDI, or what's the influence on CDI on Primo and Summon? Um, no, um, and I think I did mention this actually at the beginning. We are going to keep Summon and Primo. They are, they are both our flagship discovery systems, so um, we are absolutely going to keep them. CDI is not a discovery system. The CDI is a discovery index. Um, so what we are replacing is Primo Central and the current um, Summon, Summon index. So not Summon, but the Summon index. Um, and both Primo and Summon will, will access CDI um, for the, all the electronic um, resources, or all the centrally indexed resources, I should say. It's not just electronic resources. Okay, um, we don't have any other questions at this time. Well, there's a question that was posed to me about, can we do that now, customize having ILL requests forms where it says check availability? Um, the uh, I'm actually going to be making the uh, code for that available in GitHub um, for the uh, for the Aluna conference. Uh, so you will buy Dev Day of Aluna. Uh, there was a, a, a of please sharing the demo you cited in your presentation, um, Alan. If you have that handy and you can post it to all the uh, participants, that would be great. Sure. Um, the other thing I want to say is uh, we have done demonstrations of that ILL uh, widget, and interestingly enough, one of the things that we found was that usage for in a library loan went up 130% as a result of it, um, kind of lending some credibility to the fact that if you make it easy for people to request things, they will. 
Now, the other side of that, though, is that many times people were actually requesting stuff and then saying, oh, that isn't what I wanted. So they turned it around right away and and sent it back. Um, so part of the reason that we're still kind of trying to find the sweet spot of where that is, um, I think actually has more to do with some of the other related services that Christine was talking about. Like if we could deliver a look inside uh, service that people could actually take a look at um, some of the content of the ebook, I think we would actually reduce a number of those short loans. Okay, uh, we did there, receive uh, one late question, uh, Christine. Uh, this one's targeted at you. Um, is there a summon plugin for the Blackboard online course software that will help course developers easily integrate library resources into their courses? Um, there's no plugin for the for for Blackboard. Um, Summon does work with Blackboard. We have some customers who work with Blackboard actually, and 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 Summon. Um, about the uh, integrating library resources into the courses, um, they can probably use um, just um, um, placing it at a, a search widget into Blackboard. Um, I'm not so familiar with Blackboard, I have to say, but there, there's no uh, plugin that you can just use for that. Okay, um, since there are no other questions, uh, Mark, do you want to make some concluding remarks? Sure thing, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would just say thank you, Christine, and, and thank you, Alan, um, for these wonderful presentations. I think it was really interesting, and, and um, I think, yeah, you can see in the, the Q&A some of the uh, responses we've gotten from the attendees. Um, so I think it's a very positive response. Um, I'd also take a moment to remind the folks listening in today uh, that we did record today's program, so please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from ACRL and Choice with a link to that recording. Also, you should see in your chat box there a, a link to our brief five-question survey. If you could take a minute to fill that out uh, to let us know how we did today, we would really appreciate that. Um, and so I would just say thanks to everybody out there for joining us today. I, I hope you enjoyed the session. and. I hope the uh, rest of your day is great. So thanks very much.